Good evening, I'm Natalie Jacobson. Welcome to our celebration of care. About 40 years ago, I met a wonderful man, Dr. Murray Feingold, a pediatrician, a geneticist, who saw children who were not being cared for to the extent they needed to be. He saw that children who had rare diseases and genetic disorders often had multiple problems. If they needed a cardiologist, sometimes they also would need a neurologist. But well, who is going to A, diagnosis, B, coordinate all that, that care? Well, it was Dr. Murray Feingold. I had the privilege of sitting with him sometimes when he was with the families, the patient, the mother, the father. He spent hours with them. And he had a gift. He had a way of talking to them that calmed them, that gave them hope, that gave them direction. And specifically, he would give them options. He would even deal with their school situation, with their insurance needs. It's a whole coordinated care that we continue to this day in the fine gold model of coordinated care. That's what this is all about tonight, raising money to keep that going. Sadly, we lost Murray Feingold six years ago, but working with him for quite a long time before he passed away was Dr. Catherine Nowak. She now has taken over. Also, Dr. Amy Kritzer has joined our team. The Genesis Foundation for Children has always had three main missions. The first is medical care. So these are kids with rare disorders where there's a lot of complexity to their care, and we want to make sure they see the right consultants, that they get care in their local communities whenever possible, or that we can coordinate their various appointments. The second piece is elimination of preventable birth defects through educating the public about potential harms in the environment or medications. And the third piece was how to do therapy and have fun and have social uh, opportunities for kids and their families. How do you support families through the educational process, the social pieces, you know, trying to balance work and life? How do you acknowledge all of these things that go into the day-to-day -day experience um, that our families have to go through? With the medical piece being only one aspect of what life raising a child with a rare disease is actually about. When we sit there and we develop a care plan for a family and we have a list of, you know, 10 things that we would really like to happen between now and the next time I see that patient. What happens to that list when you're done? Um, and a lot of times for a lot of families, just getting through item one is, is a lot to do. And so how do we support families in a way that gives them that extra level of support that is available to check back in with them? Um, are there other community resources that we can connect them through that the Genesis Foundation provides where I can say, I really want you to be part of this therapeutic program. Here's the phone number you call and they'll take care of you. Um, that's the kind of level of kind of integration that a lot of families are looking for. Um, there's a lot available out in the world, but it's not easy to access. And so how do we remove those barriers to access so that all of these kids can actually take part in all these wonderful things that are there? By doing that, we maximize how well these kids are healthy, health-wise, hopefully. And then the other parts are really the educational piece of, you know, are they getting all the services they could acquire? Are they making the most of the therapies that they're getting? Can we find some more for them? And our, our hope is that at the end of their experience with us, we've maximized whatever that child's outcome could be, make sure that they hit that mark, exceed it if they can, but at least hit that mark. What we hate to see is kids who fall through the cracks and they end up with a complication they didn't need or they fall behind in the school program. And that's where that foundation support really comes in handy. I think we you stop seeing as many lapses in care so I think Dr. Noack was absolutely right. And I think without those kind of extra checks and balances, there's no way to know that those things are actually happening unless you have a family who's reaching out to you. Um, but again, that puts that burden all on the family to do those things and to feel like they can um, reach out to their team. So the more you can have others there to support them, the more confident I think everyone feels that we're actually doing everything we could be doing. 
Amy made a really interesting point to me the, uh, recently where with virtual visits, which we've mostly been doing for the past year, seeing our patients through a Zoom session or a computer session, you're in a sense making a house call. You're being invited into that family's home and for the first time you get a sort of a look behind the scenes of what the family's life is like in their home. And it's really, I think, opened our eyes to, to some of the circumstances that families face. Yeah, I think you get a sense for families who have children with behavioral issues, how they've had to modify their home just to keep it safe for their child. But I think for a lot of families, you know, having to juggle the loss of support services through the schools, through physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, it really is a, a lost year for a lot of kids in terms of the types of progress they've been able to make um, with virtual services. Um, and a lot of families had to also navigate what are they comfortable with? How do you balance the risk of losing your child's you know, education and support services versus the risks of bringing someone into your home or sending your child to school? And those are really impossible choices. There was no right choice for any one given family, um, but really caused a lot of distress, I think, with what should I do? What's the right answer now? I think the pandemic really uncovered and brought to light the fragility that so many families face. They're, they're on the cusp and you lose a business or you get downsized or you lose a job and suddenly a family who's you know, been doing fine for years is looking at housing insecurity, food insecurity. And that's difficult enough for any family. But with the families uh, more in, in your field, Amy, where they need a special diet that's costly but is essential to the child's life, and now you can't, you can't get it. I do think for some families, they felt that in some ways the pandemic showed other people what it was like to live in their experience in terms of having a child who's medically fragile and not being feeling safe to go out and about and do things that for the first time some people kind of understood why they said no to you know birthday party invitations or other things because they had to think about their child's health first and so i think in that that way that's been an interesting um, way of being seen for the first time yeah i've just been really fortunate that i've pretty much spent my career associated with the foundation. I trained with the foundation's founder, Dr. Murray Feingold, and he created this, what we now call the Feingold model of care, which really does try to do wrap around, you know, get to all the different aspects of it. And there was a brief period of time where I left to go to a different healthcare system and, and having finished my training with Dr. Feingold, and it was shocking, you know, the difference not having that additional support that I'd sort of come to take as normal <laughs> at that time in my career. And I didn't spend that long out of the, out of the fold and came back in. And, and so I've been fortunate to, to always have that, that backup. I think it's great to have things to offer. I think a lot of times, you know, I, I like to say that even when there's nothing to do, there's always something to do. And so a lot of times that's what it is. It's identifying something that I can say, you know what, this would be a great resource for you. And knowing that that's gonna be available to them, regardless of insurance or other things that are often barriers to care, um, is really wonderful because I think it empowers families to also feel like there's something they can do, it empowers providers to feel like there's something we can do. Um, and that's, that's a nice feeling at the end of the day. Thank you, Dr. Nowak, Dr. Kritzer, I'd like you to meet the Anderson family, one of our patients, Ethan, who's now 12, who began with us when he was just four years old. He's a patient of Dr. Nowak's. Listen to him and his mom, Pam. Ethan, he was 18 months when he noticed uh, he was struggling in a lot of different directions. He didn't crawl very well. He was 18 months, he was starting to walk but falling a lot. Um, Nonverbal, not talking. We um, had some testing done. They determined he was autistic. However, that didn't um, tell us why Ethan was not walking very well. Why was he always falling? Um, not being able to pick things up. So, pediatrician put out a bunch of calls. He said, "I'm going to call in a favor." So he called over to Dr. Feingold and. 
Dr. Feingold said, you know, um, I'm semi-retired, you know, taking on someone that young just isn't, you know, what I want to do. But I tell you what, I'm going to do the consult. I mean, it was a good two and a half, three hours he spent with Ethan. And he said to me at the end, he said, there's so many different things I'm seeing and none of them are falling under one umbrella. He said, I told Dr. Comer I wasn't keeping him. He goes, but I'm keeping this one. So um, that's when, you know, we started with him. He was determined he was gonna find a reason why, you know, Ethan was where he was at and we were gonna figure out what we were gonna do to move forward. I remember that he was a very nice doctor and he really did a lot of testing on me. Dr. Feingold did a lot of genetic testing um, and he really fought with our insurance company. You know, him and all of the girls fought to get this testing done and they did find that he was carrying a cardiac gene. It was um, a Park one something. Uh, but again, um, that particular gene did not coincide with why he was still having difficulties in other areas. Um, he pushed to have a cardiologist see Ethan and they got him in so quickly and it turned out, thank God they did, because Ethan had two aortic aneurysms. He still has two aortic aneurysms. Um, Dr. Feingold diagnosed him with a connective tissue disorder. He felt it was um, a clinical diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. However, Ethan didn't have the gene. He still believed this was something that Ethan carried. It's what gave him an answer to a lot of Ethan's medical issues. My brother could talk when he was like free, but I couldn't talk till I was like four years old. And if I were to make friends when I was four, then I wouldn't be able to talk to them. They have helped coordinate all of his care. Um, Dr. Norwalk and the girls that work with her have taken right over where Dr. Feingold left off. Um, they help coordinate his IEP at school. They give us ideas of what they should be working on. I think I would describe her a very nice doctor. She was really helpful. And she's like Dr. Feingold, the really helpful girl. <laughs> we had PT, we had OT, we had speech, we had feeding therapy, and we got the riding therapy. So he did do horseback riding. All of those things helped Ethan become verbal. So it was a lot of, it, it's a lot of coordination that without a foundation or someone behind us, a full team who's familiar with Ethan, this is nine years later, and they are still helping us coordinate where he needs to be next. They've made a big difference in my life. <laughs> Without them, we would be lost in the medical world. We would just be out there floundering. So when people that are able to make those donations and help fund these programs, help fund all of this testing um, and the time that these physicians spend to help us, it's just an enormous gift. Ethan, you have to have the best tree house in the entire world. Invite me over sometime. One of our many programs is Mother to Baby. It's a resource center, both for parents and for physicians. It's run by Patricia Marklin Cole. Mother to Baby um, has been in operation since 1980, and it was an auxiliary program of Dr. Feingold's clinic, the National Birth Defect Center. At that time, it was called the Pregnancy Environmental Hotline, but then it became the Pregnancy Exposure Info Line, and now we're Mother to Baby. And so basically, we handle any question that has to deal with um, pregnancy, either before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and now we handle breast breastfeeding questions. So, um, you know, right now, of course, the hot button topic is COVID-19. We are actually listed on the CDC website as a resource. So we have been um, getting so many COVID questions um, from the public, um, you know, 
before pregnancy, during pregnancy, breastfeeding, um, just because the CDC listed us as um, a reliable resource that the public could tap into. So we're, we're feeling it all over the country. <laughs> we're feeling it here in New England, but we're glad that we can be there. That's what we're here for. We are the only service here in New England playing that role. Um, and how people mainly get to know about us is through the doctor's offices. So OBGYN practices, um, midwives, doulas refer to us, and that's how they get connected to us. And then, you know, they can call on their own, and sometimes um, we are also a resource for the clinician when they're trying to keep up with the fast-changing medical environment and information for their patients. So I think on both ends for the provider as well as the public, what makes us unique is just our access um, you know, to information that we can rely, that they just can't seem to lay their hands on to help them with the decision when necessary. Just recently, um, dealing with COVID, I had a pregnant woman who wanted to know, should I get this shot during my pregnancy? Or can I really just hold off on it? And she came to us and I presented to her the information available from the American College of Obstetrics Gynecologists, as well as the Centers for Disease Control, and what information we presently had available. And while they are telling all pregnant women that the decision is there, because of the information we had, she felt more um, able to make a decision for her pregnancy that she just didn't get before. I'm just glad that we're here for that purpose and reason. And so having the funding to keep going um, is vital um, to keep us in operation. You know, there's so many people who say, I wish I knew about you in my first pregnancy. You know, I didn't know about you. And, um, you know, they just find us invaluable and they say, I will refer people to you and I will call again. So that's vital. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Siegel from the Matt in the Morning Show on KISS 108. I've been involved with the Genesis Foundation since meeting the wonderful Dr. Murray Feingold over 20 years ago. In addition to proceeds being raised through KISS 108's annual KISS concert, I have personally been a supporter of the cause. In 2019, I was asked to MC the annual Founders Gala, named in honor of Dr. Feingold, for the foundation's biggest fundraising night of the year. And I'm speaking to you now for the celebration of care to continue supporting the organization at this time of great need. We've heard from Drs. Nowak and Kritzer about the type of care that the Feingold Center is able to provide their patients, and from the Andersons about the profound beneficial impact it's had on their lives. This level of care wouldn't be possible without the Genesis Foundation. Dr. Feingold founded this organization and Mother to Baby to provide unique and exceptional care that just did not exist. Nearly 40 years later, the needs of patients and parents remain. The Genesis Foundation supports a number of therapy programs for children with special needs, and we'll hear from two of these programs the Bordadale Preschool Music Therapy Program and the Lovelane Farm Special Needs Horseback Riding Program next. These therapy programs are often an essential part of the holistic care that is necessary for these children and adults to live their lives to their full potential. Your support as donors makes all these programs possible. Please join me in making a donation to the foundation so they can continue to fund this remarkable work and make such a difference in the lives of so many families. Thank you for attending the Celebration of Care. So we've been fortunate to have um, music therapy now for quite a few years. Um, we have had many different therapists come to us, which has been really great in itself because they bring diversity. Um, their backgrounds are very different, and so that's been a, a, a gift in itself. The kids really enjoy it. They come in, um, they usually have activities that are closely aligned with the themes that we're using in the classroom, so it really helps. Um, it really helps the learning. It helps make connections to the learning that's happening in the classroom. Having the Genesis Foundation provide this is 
it's just been an amazing gift to the preschool because there is no other way that, um, these, that this program could happen. You know, we don't have that type of funding. The kids that we have here in our program are um, early learning, uh, early pre-language for some kids. Some kids are, are using language and some kids are proficient in language. There's quite a, a range in the development. So um, music is just such a great uh, venue, a great tool for kids because it helps them with attention. It helps them with their focus of, of you know, not only what we're doing, but the kind of like the bigger picture of, of what we're trying to accomplish. They, music also is um, a great way to practice language. And tap, tap, tap your knees, tap your knees together. So during COVID, um, the, the kids have been getting their music therapy uh, through a video that Miss Amanda sends to us once a week. It's a link. Children who are at home learning are able to access a video. And the children who are in school in person, we show the video with them. So we're there supporting the kids as we would be if she were in person. Then the kids are just participating. They are fully participating. They, they sing, they dance, they move, they um, use scarves and eggs and sticks and rhythm sticks and we're doing all the, the the things that Miss Amanda wants us to be doing. We sing a goodbye song to her and we say goodbye to Miss Amanda. So for the kids it, we try to make it as as um, normal as we can. So it, it really comes in 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 handy when um, there are kids that are have sensory integration issues, that have behavioral issues um, and sometimes yes uh, a music therapist can come in and bring us, you know, the the rain drum, something that's very calming and, and very soothing, things that we don't have here and wouldn't think about. You know, we have our own bag of tools, but to bring that, that rain drum and, and have the kids, you know, go from up here to, uh, you know, calm down, that's very helpful. Um, and that's just one example. There's nothing better as a teacher, as a parent, um, just knowing that your kids are moving forward and, and are getting it. And, and especially um, when your child may not be where they should be developmentally and you see those connections, it's just like, yes! <laughs> One great moment and it's, it's wonderful. It's worth everything. Can we go find your horse? One, two, three! After a high school friend had a car accident um, and was in a coma, and I saw how he learned to walk and talk and everything, and that made me want to be a therapist when I grew up. And I fell into a job when I was completely incapable of doing it, um, running a therapeutic riding program when I was in college. Debbie Sabin not only grew into the job, she ended up growing Love Lane, her own special needs riding program. You know, went from me and five volunteers to a staff of 20 and a permanent home with an indoor arena. People kept coming and it's just been such an amazing journey because now we have over 100 riders a week. Hi. Riders like four-year-old Oliver while Oliver receives a variety of early intervention services at home and preschool, these weekly sessions provide a unique, integrated approach. We knew it would be something that would be helpful, but I didn't expect him to love it so much the, the whole time and to work so hard and for it to be an activity that incorporated all the areas that he needs to work on. It's also providing balance reactions, postural adjustments, endurance, um, but you can incorporate so many other things into the therapeutic riding. You can do uh, sensory integration treatment, speech therapy, cognitive, physical, fine motor. If he's gonna make the horse trot, then it's so inspiring to say, you know, I want more fast. Hi. Hi. 
one. Please. Good job. I want fast, please. Okay. Here you do so much in a half an hour, and it's so joyful. It's magical to see how happy he is, and to see him, you know, make progress and do new things. One. Go. Please. Good job. You might say that the Genesis Foundation plays the role of magician's assistant at Lovelane. Yeah, what happens at Love Lane is transformational. The grant from the Genesis Foundation has allowed us to focus on our mission, which is to serve children with disabilities. And it means that that money can go directly into what happens in the ring, which means we can prepare our horses with good training. Our instructors are established with great certifications or they're OTs or PTs or speech therapists. I think the funding from the Genesis Foundation uh, makes this possible for most families, definitely for us. It's an expensive endeavor and to have uh, support, it makes it possible for us to be able to do this. I'm able to see how successful he is when he's motivated and happy, um, and I think it shifts my perspective. Good job, Debbie Clapp. Okay. That's what we want. We want what happens here to extend out into their world, and that is what's transformational. Dr. Murray Feingold's vision carries us a long way, and we carry on with it, with our wonderful doctors, with our board of directors, with so many people who try and help these children. Thank you very much for helping us. Unfortunately, this all costs money. So if you've donated, thank you. And if you haven't, please do give. We need you.